to questions, debate, discussion, whatever kind of things. Anybody want to kick off with a question? John. Stephen, can I ask you, we've, we've heard a lot about whether Scotland will or will not be accepted into the EU. Yeah. Um, a yes vote. Yeah. And <clears throat> it's, it seems to be that of 28 countries, it mm -hmm. only takes one veto. Mm -hmm. What would happen if, or can I put it this way, could the rest of the UK be with Scotland's membership of the EU? I'd say no, but rather taking my word for it, I, I noticed that there's a, there's a guy called Graham Avery, who's non Secretary General of, of, of the European Commission, was up in front of the Scotland Committee recently and saying it was, you know, he just couldn't see circumstances in which, in fact, he's, he's, he's also the guy, this guy, um, Graham Avery, who's an interesting guy, he's going to look at, have a look at his evidence they gave a few weeks ago. He's been responsible for something like, he, he, he was a UK civil servant, a British civil servant, and then when the UK joined the European Union, he, he went to serve the European Union. So he's been responsible for overseeing something ridiculous, like 20, 20 accession processes into the European Union. Um, and he said that, that the, he, he considers that the, the UK and Scotland would be in a, a roughly similar boat. And even if they weren't, he thought it was inconceivable that Scotland wouldn't be a member. I mean, we, we have to remember, so it's, it's, it's interesting to turn this in his head sometimes. The European Union is bending over backwards. I'd argue rightly, because I think it's a good investment to get Serbia in, to get Bosnia in, to get Macedonia in. It's just taken Bulgaria and Romania. Now, the EU is, if, if the EU is anything, it's a political beast that finds political solutions to things. To think that Scotland, which has the longest, it's got the EU's longest external border, of course, with the Faroe Islands, Iceland, Norway, because um, the EU border lies somewhere over there, has Europe's best, um, has Europe's best energy resources, both in terms of renewables and hydrocarbons. Um, and also has its, might many of its best food and drinks, and Scotland is also, is currently a net contributor and will continue to be a net contributor. To think that the European Union wouldn't want us in, I think is inconceivable. I also argue this from, from obviously from a personal basis, I think Scotland would you know, the, the, the EU would lose out an awful lot more than Scots ever would if they were to go down that route. I can't, I can't see it. People like Graham Avery have argued, and there was another, um, former Director General from the European Commission was up in front of the Scottish Parliament this morning, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but if you look at this morning's evidence, even another Director General um, came up and said, it's again inconceivable that Scotland would be a member. Hi Stephen, thank you for sharing your speech. I'm extremely concerned about the media, mm -hmm. the, all aspects of it, and they take for instance that Spanish chap that, that spoke out there in, in the the media went into meltdown. Mm. It was on the news, it was yeah. uh, And out of all the countries, if you pick Germany or Finland, to say something positive about Scotland, mm. it was all those to pick from, but the media picked that Spanish guy, and he got so much hype. Mm. Uh, I mean, are we doing anything to counter that? <coughs> if somebody just stood up and said, well, let's give it a, a balance point and to the BBC about Germany, Germany wants us in there. I suppose we've got a problem in that, I mean, the Sunday Herald revealed recently, and I don't know what's going on in the British Foreign Office, but the Sunday Herald revealed recently that the British Foreign Office has been approaching a fairly unpalatable character, Vladimir Putin, who is no, um, no Democrat, um, to come out and say something against Scottish independence. Now, if they got caught out in Russia, I'm sure that it's been happening elsewhere. Now, Scotland doesn't have its own foreign office, so it's very difficult to be going out there and doing things. What's fascinated me, um, and um, if you have a look at the Scottish Global Forums, other work we've done, but just have a look for plain, straightforward in Scottish Parliament's witnesses um, who have been giving evidence to the European External Affairs Committee. Um, these aren't people that the SNP's asked to, uh, who the SNP encouraged to do things or say things. I mean, these are people who I've just mentioned who are senior former senior British civil servants within, within European institutions who are coming out of their own volition and saying what you're saying doesn't make sense. And I was most interested to see, um, there was an article by a guy called Angus Roxburgh, who was the BBC's correspondent in Moscow and then he was the BBC's correspondent in, um, in Brussels, who also came out and said that, Jose Manuel Barroso came out and said something when the European Commission President came out and compared Scotland with Kosovo. 
Um, he said he was clearly out of his depth and didn't really know what mm. he was talking about. And it was interesting, there was a press conference the next day which again didn't get reported. And the press conference that came out the following day um, had the spokesman saying that this really wasn't a, that maybe the Commission President had been misinterpreted and he hadn't been misinterpreted at all here, but he said let's face facts. But it was interesting that the Commission official spokesperson was trying to backpedal from what had been said. Especially because I was down at a meeting in the European Commission a couple of weeks ago, down in London, we've got a London office. Um, and I was trying to talk to them about the independence referendum and they weren't interested. The only thing they're interested in is the fact that for all the while that pundits across and politicians in Westminster are saying that Scotland's EU membership is under threat, actually the only, the only way you can be under threat is by remaining within the Union because the polls are starting to go, are starting to tip in the way of UKIP. You could see the UK, UK getting chucked out of the European Union by voluntarily, and if, if that's what they want democratically, then that's their business. But that, to me, strikes me as the, the, the easiest way for, for the UK to, to leave the European Union. Um, it was also interesting, just on media reporting, the University of the West of Scotland came out with a report recently. I don't know if any of you picked up on that. And this was a democrat, this, this, this was an academic, a dry academic study that showed that um, actually the press were guilty of being biased against the independents. And if, if anybody read the Daily Mail, I, I'm, I'm not sure if anybody did. You don't have to admit it. Okay, so I'll, I'll just put it out there. Um, there was a poll that came out overnight, the Daily Mail commissioned the first poll since um, Cameron and Osborne's intervention on the currency, and it showed a significant shift in favour of yes, but it was reported as um, the Scottish population wants Salmon to have a plan B, and actually you had to read right down to the bottom of it before you picked up that this came from a, an opinion poll that showed a shift to yes. But the University of West of Scotland reports very, very interesting. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, an invest, it's, a, it's a study they've done in the West of Scotland, and the BBC are clearly taking, you know, are taking it seriously and challenging it. I think it's something like three to two is the kind of ratio in terms of, you know, and, and that is, I think, one of the galling things in this is that we have a, an impartial broadcaster who's being anything else but impartial through this. But that's a different, different debate, maybe. On, on, on the broadcasting, the world's changing, it's changing everywhere. Um, this is why, I mean, yes, Scotland's got, there are 300 local groups across the country um, who are talking to people about independence. Uh, 300 yes groups, such as in the area here where you've got active and enthusiastic people who want to go out and chat doors and talk to folk, <coughs> organise meetings like this and encourage people to come along and be open to questions. Um, that, along with things like social media amongst certain demographics is almost becoming more important. I was speaking to a friend of mine the other day who's, 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 who's not a political person, had been in the pub with his dad at the weekend, this is anecdotal, um, but he said he left the pub and as he left the pub, every single table he overheard a conversation going on about the independence referendum and I think that's, that's, that's where the media cease to have the, the impact that they maybe once did because community groups have become really important. And one study that was done recently was showing that people don't necessarily trust things that a politician they, they haven't met, and that, that goes for SNP politicians and politicians of every party. In the same way, they might not always trust what a celebrity says or what, what they hear on the news or what they read in the newspaper, but they will think about what their friends have said and what their neighbours have said and what their work colleagues have said. And if people are talking about it, and if you have these 300 groups across Scotland where people are fired up to talk about it, that have a significant impact, more so than it has done on an election in the past, I think so anyway. So do you think, Stephen, we should all go out of the pub? <laughs> <laughs> I think we should all camp in the pub <laughs> for the next seven months. Yeah. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> well, it's, it's just that when you, I'm a bit of a current affairs mm -hmm. the, the thing is, when, when you read in the papers, and I, the Sunday Post is like tasks, yeah. Do you know these one of these guys that you've got there and I, I think we have a go them? But the thing is what you read in the papers, all of them are going the gondola and what's actually happening and you speak to people, it's like worlds of that. It's, and you, you keep telling them what's going to really happen after September with all the all the nonsense you've been printing. It's just It was it was interesting in Osborne's intervention on the currency union. And I think the Westminster government have been working on this for a little while and they thought that this was going to be a real sort of, this, this was a big deal and they lined up the civil servant 
they've lined up the Liberals and the Labour. I mean, these things don't happen. I've worked in government, they do the best one in the world. These things don't just happen. These take months and months and months of preparation. So that, that, that was their big shot. And it was interesting to see the latest poll that came out in the Daily Mail poll as well showed that, if anything, it shifted things more in favour of yes. I was, I was on a phone, I just thought you were you better. It's just that I was on a phone in the other day, and I've been on it before, maybe say, obviously, Kate. Morning call. Morning call. Oh, oh call Kate. Yeah, call Kate, that's it. I, I, I missed it, she's got another standing lassie during the week, so I missed her every time. But anyway, for the first time, I mean, every time it's been called, it's on meltdown. But for the first time, a, the person that was asking me, mm. she said, I've got to ask you before you, you speak whether you're yes or no. There was, there was so many people voting yes, and three Labour supporters had just shifted totally when they seen Ed Ball saying, no, we don't know what. And that was it. Mm. So they had to ask you to filter you, otherwise it wouldn't look balanced. Yeah. So that's, no, what you read in the papers and all the people out there are. Yes, we could fuck it up. Absolutely. That's really important. Right. Thanks, Colin. I'm, I hesitate to put my hand up because while Stephen was speaking, I was looking around and I was noticing that almost everybody in Elston was nodding here and there regularly. <laughs> um, so I feel I'm going to be a little, a little bit like a devil's advocate on no, this no, one. Please do. It makes it more interesting. Um, uh, there's a host of questions I'd like to ask. Let me, let me ask you this one. Um, Going, I'm, I'm not going to engage in this, you know, bash the media thing or the conspiracy theories of yeah. Westminster. I want to go back to the first uh, questioner who talked about EU membership. Mm. And your pitch on Scotland and the EU mm -hmm. dwelt on two things mm -hmm. the, the mechanics and the practicalities of voting in QMV and all of yeah. that. Yeah. And it also set out said a number of propositions which I would not just the same as everybody else in the room about. The, the, the attributes and the qualities and the, what you might call the unique selling points of Scotland. Mm. Fisheries, food and drink, etc. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, most Scots, whatever view they want to take mm. in the referendum, would nod to those sort of things. The thing I have, one of the many things I have difficulty with is this. When issues like Scotland within the EU, Scotland and the EU comes up, mm -hmm. and there's a parallel also with Scotland and sterling and currency, but let's not go there for the moment. Um, the response is very much the same sort of line as you've been taking. Mm -hmm. But of course, Scotland has all these super qualities. Mm -hmm. But of course, it is good for Europe mm -hmm. that Scotland should be engaged. Um, but of course, we have assets, and of course, all Scots would nod at that yeah. because it it pushes the right buttons. I have, in a sense, two questions. One is, you're addressing and debating the nuts and bolts of voting patterns, mm -hmm. QMB and all of that, and needing to be at the top table mm -hmm. and so on. Naturally, that's something we would all aspire to. My nagging worry is that the issue that Scotland and the protagonists of independence have got to grip mm -hmm. and haven't yet is not whether or not Scotland's going to be at the top table, mm -hmm. but whether they're going to be in the room. Because if Scotland and Scotland's assets are such wonderfully attractive selling points or buying points, if Scotland is such a brilliant contributor, and we'd all like to think it is, mm -hmm. then why the hell aren't the other 27, 28 member states of the European Union you know, lining up in chorus to welcome the proposition of an independent Scotland? You know, the prov and now, let, let's not say it all because the media doesn't reflect that. I do get the clear impression that outside of Scotland, and I don't just mean south of the border, I mean across Europe and arguably wider than that, mm -hmm. few others actually buy the assertions that Scotland's leaders are so keen to 
to present to the audiences they address. Now, when they present those assertions about the wondrousness of Scotland within Scotland, mm -hmm. of course it gets applause. But I actually have serious concerns and doubts that others are quite as per persuaded. And so simply to say, it's inconceivable that Europe wouldn't want Scotland, or it's inconceivable that Scotland couldn't play a role on the international scene. To me, it is entirely conceivable. And that worries me like hell. Because the notion that Scotland should, so to speak, cast itself adrift, mm -hmm. and then find that it isn't welcomed at the top table, mm -hmm. that it can't, uh, so to speak, make an economic relationship with the rest of the UK work, that it ends up with a Panamanian-style currency arrangement, all these things will be bad for Scotland. I wasn't meaning to make a speech, and from it's that, a it's fair. not clear, perhaps, what my question is. But my question is, if this is all so wonderful, why aren't people outside these borders um, you know, endorsing it? Can I just, just to answer that, and that's why I saw it, I was listening, I was just taking some notes mm -hmm. of the things, the, 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 the points you, you were making. Um, and thanks, and thanks for making that. I mean, I just sort of provoked some discussion. It would make for a, a thoroughly dull evening. Um, First of all, on the point, is Scotland going to be in the room? Now, the, the, the first thing to, to throw out here, right, and it's, it's something that lawyers have been throwing out there, is Scotland's been a member of the European Union for 40 years. Right? We are, whether you like it or the not, UK. You, whether you like it or not, you are, you are a European <laughs> citizen. With that, as a European citizen, you have a number of responsibilities, but you also have a number of rights. There is nothing in the treaties for taking that citizenship back off of you again. There is nothing to provide within the treaties for a member state leaving. The only precedence that exists for it was back in the 1980s when Greenland decided that it did not, it no longer wished to be a member of the European Union and it took three years of constitutional and legal wrangling for the Greenlanders. And, and to be fair to the European institutions, the European institutions turned around and said, well, if you don't want to be a member, and the Danes said, well, we don't want to be a member, so everybody agreed, fair enough, Greenland can go its own way, in much the same way there was already precedent with the Faroe Islands. Um, it took them three years to do that, and it caused constitutional havoc. Um, on the whole point with, so, first of all, there is no provision for turfing us out. There isn't. On the provision of um, the 28 member states, <coughs> you made the point that um, why is not bending over backwards to welcome us? Now, there was an interesting activity that again the Daily Mail undertook, which is they phoned around every single foreign service in, in the European Union to ask <coughs> them what you think about Scottish independence. And the answer that they got pretty much universally was this is an internal matter for the United Kingdom or this is an internal matter for the people of Scotland. Even the Spanish who have bent over backwards to say this is totally different from Catalonia, it's a different constitutional situation from Catalonia, um, and said this is an internal matter. Now that's where, and for fear I'm an SNP member, I know there are a number of other, for, for fear of losing my own side on this one, I'm going to say it, that is where to be to his credit, David Cameron dealt with the Edinburgh Agreement, and I to his credit that was a good thing to do, because he gave certainty, he gave a legal basis, and he recognised the SNP had won a majority and therefore a referendum should follow. So you provide certainty around that. And that Edinburgh Agreement made a huge difference in European capitals, not least Madrid, because in their opinion, um, they do not want to get involved in internal politics. Um, so sitting politicians will tend not to get involved because they do not want the backlash. One, the, the one intervention I have seen um, it was quite interesting, was a former Irish foreign minister called Jerry Collins. And I always find the views of former politicians to be a lot more interesting than those of current politicians because they tend to say what they think. And Jerry Collins came out and was fully in favour of independence, reflecting on his own country's experiences of independence and saying there was no chance, no chance that they'd ever want to give that up again. Um, so I, I, I think this whole thing of why, why aren't the member states falling over falling over themselves to intervene in our debate. 
I think it would be wrong actually for 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 a minister to be coming here and intervening in, 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 to, to be intervening in our debate. Finally, <coughs> sorry, I'm not going to you had a few points raised and I wanted to address them. Finally, um, you talked about again sorry, I'm going to make two more points. Another one you talked about, well, Scotland might be out. Now the European Union when there were no rules for this, but when you had German reunification, you had 20 million East Germans, so four times the population of Scotland, with a crippled Soviet-style economy, um, who hadn't been part of West Germany's success, um, were an economic disaster area, were incorporated into the EU in absolutely no time. What the EU said was they said that all the international treaties that, that originally applied um, to West Germany and East Germany continue to apply. What that meant was East Germany had to leave the Warsaw Pact as quickly as it possibly could so that West Germany didn't have to join the Warsaw Pact. Um, what it also meant was that East Germany got fast-tracked into the European Union. Another point on this is, if you look at the former Soviet states, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, um, they were in the European Union in next to no time after the fall of the after the fall of the Soviet Union, and comparatively speaking, next to no time, and had this, um, and for what I personally think has been one of Europe's great success stories. So Europe is fairly expansionist to try and kick out one of its richest members. I, I just I think you try to apply a bit of common sense here. The final point that I'll make, the final, I promise you, the final point of your point there, is you said this will be disastrous for Scotland. We'll have some kind of Panamanian sort of situation. Well, this is a choice that we make with independence, okay? The choice that we make is, do we trust Westminster to make our decisions for us? And do we entrust in them? Or do we make decisions for ourselves? Back in 1979, there was a Daily Express editorial. And the Daily Express editorial, just a few weeks before the, um, I, I don't remember it firsthand, and I'm sure nobody else does here, but you all go and look up the internet when you get home tonight and find it. The Daily Express article said, if there's an assembly, what will happen to our coal mines? What will happen to Ravenscraig? What will happen to the car manufacturing in Linwood? Now, the assembly never happened. Ravenscraig shut, Linwood shut, and the coal mine shut. So, when you talk about will Scotland become independent and become some sort of banana republic, I, I, at first I think it's a misnomer, but similarly, you are taking a risk by staying within the union, and it's, I suppose, you've got to weigh up the chance where, are, where is our greatest opportunity for making your own decisions? Or is it staying within the, the, the union and then leaving somebody else to make our decisions for us? Thank Sorry, that, that was a long answer, but. Uh, so, do I get the right reply? Yes, it, well, I want to also give other folk an opportunity. Sure. I think, you know, just in terms of, you know, the, the certainties that are there, and I think there is an issue over, you know, people are looking for certainties, and you can't give certainties. But the likelihood of Scotland being removed from the European community is an awful lot less likely than Nigel Farage being our deputy prime minister in a year or two's time. And that's, you know, again, it's about Scotland making choices that are right for Scotland rather than relying on Westminster making choices that might be right for Scotland. Can I, somebody else? Helena. No, I was just thinking about the, the European perspective from the man in the street on taking uh, the independence debate seriously. There's something to remember here about the confusion. Even fairly educated people in other European countries make the same mistake as many people do here about uh, regarding the Netherlands as synonymous with Holland and think it's just two names for the same country. They do it about the UK and England and think that England is another name for the whole entity. Therefore, when they see something about Scottish independence from the UK, it becomes very, very confusing, and they go off to the next subject. John. Uh, the thing is, it's a question that's never been asked to the Scottish people in the streets. Uh, and I lived in England for 34 years. Uh, my children are going to show. We can tell you've picked up the accent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, the, the thing is, there's never been a Scotsman asked in the street, do you want to sit at the top table? Westminster, England, and the Empire is obsessed with sitting at the top table, which equals tribal. 
and it's absolutely nowhere. When we're getting the tax, the bedroom tax imposed on us, who gives a damn about the top table? But what? But all the poverty and all the rest in Glasgow and the other big cities of the country. So basically, we're not really interested in sitting at the top table. I'm going to go to Brian and give him a chance to come back just because I, you know, I don't know if there's anybody that hasn't asked a question or spoken that wants to ask Stephen. I'm happy to yeah. come back. Yeah. yeah. Can I can I take a couple who have sure. spoken first kind of thing? Yes. Um, so, so, sorry, no. Sorry, yourself. Uh, the situation in in Spain between Catalonia and Spain. Um, it, that is seen by some as sort of a parallel with the situation in Scotland. Uh, is it affecting um, the way the Scottish situation with the UK is being seen at all? I mean, politically or in the media? Is it to our advantage or disadvantage that they're going through a similar process? Can I answer that? Of course. Um, I know that in, in, with, with, with some people that there is, uh, we have a very strong partnership with a lot in, in, in the European Free Alliance, of which the SNP is a member. That we have a lot of um, that we have a lot of ties, and there's, there's there, 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 there are personal links to people in Catalonia and Flanders. Um, I think that the that the people of Catalonia and, and, and have got to make up their own minds. And I think people of Scotland have got to make up their own minds. I think that um, I think that the two happening at the same time does affect it to a certain extent because you get media coverage. Because then, <coughs> but I, I actually think that personally, I, I'd, I'd rather we just go on with our Scottish independence referendum because we're already asking people to make in Scotland to make a pretty big decision and one that's got many different caveats. And I think sometimes that if we start to think about what do we think about the Catalan situation, it can add another layer to what's already quite a difficult debate and what's, what's, what's um, quite a cause. That's basically the, the number of question. Is it likely to become a greater distraction? And, and, um... I hope not. Yeah. That, that, yeah, and what I suppose what I'm trying to say, going about in far too many words, is I want to focus on the Scottish independence referendum. Yeah. And I think that the Catalan independence referendum could become a distraction for us, but in the same way that I hope we're not becoming a distraction for people who hold legitimately held views on both sides of the equation in Catalonia as well. Um, so I think having them, I think the Catalans are, they're not really allowed to, but um, under their constitution, but the, 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 the devolved administration has every intention of holding a referendum um, two months after or a month after the Scottish referendum. Um, I personally would have hoped there was a bit more distance. Is, is that likely to have affected Barroso's stance? I think, well, one thing one thing that was certainly happening in Brussels, and I have this on anecdotal evidence, was that um, on the whole legal advice thing, it's just the UK has never asked for legal advice. Only the UK can ask for legal advice in Scotland's accession um, to, to the European Union to answer so that all of our questions, so that we don't have to sit here and talk about hypotheticals with a hard and fast answer. We don't have that answer because the UK has never asked for an answer. Um, in Brussels, the Scots are talking to the Commission to a certain extent, the British government are talking to it to a certain extent, but on the fringes, the Spanish and the Catalans, that is, a, that is the very heart of their debate, and Spanish officials and Catalan officials are lobbying, um, Span are lobbying European politicians ferociously on this particular issue. Um, and certainly what's happened with spokespeople, a number of spokespeople, if you look back over the press, if you have time, go and look back over the press with the European Commission interventions in the Scottish debate, and what you will find will be, will be an intervention, and then the day afterwards will be a retraction from a spokesperson, because they, they seem to have the Spanish and Catalan situation at the top of their, at the, in, in their mind, rather than the Scottish situation, and I have no doubt that Jose Manuel Barroso, who after all was Prime Minister of Portugal, so we'll have strong links and a good understanding of the situation in neighbouring Spain, um, has a greater understanding of that particular situation than he does of the Scottish situation. And his remarks on Sunday clearly seem to illustrate that, well, I hope he's got a better understanding of that situation, because he clearly has a very poor understanding of the Scottish situation. And it was interesting, as I said earlier on, when his spokesman tried to backtrack on his comments at her weekly press press conference next week. 
Can I just touch upon the two comments that were made, just to give you some kind of response? Um, first on the point about North and South Holland. One thing for Europeans, so you talk North and South Holland are a bit frustrated everybody else lives in the rest of the Netherlands. Um, yes, it is. Um, but one thing that that illustrates that um, as a member state, you have a brand. So, so the really important thing in Europe with so half a billion citizens, the biggest market in the world, um, is it with 5.3 million citizens, you might be a normal sized member state of the European Union, but you still have to work really, really, really hard to get folks to pay attention. The same thing goes for the Dutch, it goes for the Germans who will spend, spend a lot of money on getting, getting their regional brands, if you like, um, in front of European decision makers and, and, and other people. That's, that's a part of your job, that's a part of our job as Scots would be to try and sell our brand to the rest of the world. Um, we're held back by the fact that we don't have that. We, we've, we've got the brand recognition, but that's not for reasons. That's held back by being part of a bigger member state. Um, on the top table, I, I see your point entirely. I've tried and I agree 100%. I suppose in the European situation, but I, I suppose you, you, so many decisions are made at that top table around the Council of Ministers about day-to-day -day stuff. I mean, the Council of Ministers sits and makes decisions on the size of fishing nets that can be deployed. Out, of, um, out, 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 out the harbours along the coast here, which is just, you know, in Slovakia and Hungary and Luxembourg, have all got more votes on the, the the mesh net sizes and gears that fishermen operating out of harbours along the coast here can use. Uh, it just doesn't make sense, and most folk can see it doesn't make sense. Um, but I suppose while that system's in place, you're trying to have a seat and have a vote on it. Actually, I actually meant historically. Sorry, just, just one point then. Uh, can I take Gordon just now, John? Yeah, uh, just to ask a question about the, the pound. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, we need the pound. Uh -huh. And uh, to me, without the pound, I see a lot of business and the country going to meltdown because we need it. And I have a question I would ask is being independent away from. England, mm -hmm. how much is the pound going to be worth? Can I say on the pound? Because it's, 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 it's been a big debate. I know it's not oh. what we're here to discuss today, but it's a really important point yeah. to bring up. Um, on the pound, I think one thing that's been lost in this whole debate over the past little while mm -hmm. yeah. is that from the Scottish Government, to be fair to the Scottish Government, what they did was it wasn't just politicians sitting there and saying we think the pound's best, right? The Scottish Government put together a fiscal working group with some of the finest economists in the country, Nobel laureates, um, people who are eminently better qualified than I am to talk about um, whether or not we should have the pound. Now, having put together that fiscal working group and the reports out there, and it's on the internet, you're going to look at it, that group came back and said, in the event of independence, the currency union keeping the pound is the best option. Now, before George Osborne made his intervention, it was last year, Alistair Darling, um, came out and said, in the event of independence, currency union would make sense. I was on, I was, um, I was doing a debate the other day on BBC News 24 with a guy called Professor Jim Gallagher, who's an advisor to the, to the No campaign. And he'd said a year ago that in the event of independence, that, the, you know, that, that Scotland and the remainder of the UK was actually the optimum, that was his word, the optimum area for fiscal, for, for fiscal union. So, you've got all these, fo the, the reason I want to quote them is rather than have some, some political guy turn up and say this is a good idea, I think sometimes you need to look to the experts and ask the experts, and to be fair to the Scottish Government, that's what they did. Now, George Osborne never did that before he made his statement last week. Um, so, in terms of it making sense, the, the evidence is there, and the one thing that strikes me is that Remember we own the pound as, as much as England owns the pound, yeah. that, that's a common, right? Yeah. Bank of England was set up by a Scottish guy. Right. Um, so we own it. Post-independence, I honestly think, right, people are certain. Um, what people say before, like any election, what people say before the election, what they say the day after, or how they interact together, are two totally different things. And if George Osborne, if Scotland votes to become independent, I think it would. For George Osborne to say, right, we're not cooperating with you, we're going to throw up economic barriers, we're not going to have a currency union, will cost English businesses an absolute fortune. Because yeah. Scotland's got 
a trade surplus with with England. It's one of the few places in the world with whom we have a, a sort of trade surplus. There was uh, something on on the Sunday morning. He shot about the uh, man there, and he was asked that question. But he just threw it. He threw it out like no. Did he was asked that question? It would cost him millions or billions. Yeah. Uh, there, there, there are no numbers, but I mean, I, I just think uh, it's really interesting. Yeah, the fiscal working group came together, put together a proposal, um, and then it was sort of George Osborne well, cobbled together. That, that that was a Westminster political so decision. Can we can we can we use up pound? Just say either them. Can we use it? Well, yeah, yeah, can. yeah, we can. Absolutely use can. It. There's, There's an interesting. Really yeah. There's an interesting article that came out the day after George Osborne's speech in the Wall Street Journal that made exactly that point. Right. Um, now you can agree with it or not, but the Wall Street Journal, which obviously is no dog in the fight, came out and said, "Well, of course it makes sense for Scotland to," and then quoted a number of these eminent economists, such as Sir James Merlees, who's the Nobel laureate who sat on it, um, who sat on the fiscal working group. <coughs> Um, I made exactly that point. Look, you can keep on using it. Now, I think if both governments are being sensible, and I think both governments would be sensible, um, afterwards, you come to some kind of currency union because to penalise your own businesses just because Scotland's ex expressed its democratic will just wouldn't make sense. Oh, well, I agree it would have. If we rejected the pound and we have to wear our currency, I don't think that pound would be worth the same amount of money. No, we've also got the balance of payments. It wouldn't be worth the sale now. Yes. They wouldn't get, they'll get less. So there'll be no winners. Yeah. Yeah. Brian, can I let you back in? Well, the discussion's moved on and gone down some different roads from, from when we had the first exchange, so yeah. I slightly hesitate to go back to it. That's it's okay for me. But I wanted, to, I wanted to go back on, on three specific points sure. on, your, on, on your response to the points I made. One was perhaps I was a bit flippant in referring to Panama. I was not envisaging Scotland or visualising Scotland as some kind of an armed republic. It was a, it was a slightly uh, technical comment relating to the nature of the relationship between the US dollar and the way Panama and mm. certain other countries operate their currencies. So it was, a, it was if you like, an in-joke which perhaps took you down the path of banana republics when it wasn't intended to. Leave that aside. I was interested, going back to the key point about Scotland and its relationship with Europe, mm -hmm. about two of the points you made. Um, and I wanted to come back to you on those. Mm. One was, of course, you were entirely right, and it was totally predictable that in canvassing around Europe, um, the response that you got was the correct political response, mm -hmm. which is, these are internal affairs, this is a matter for you know, the UK and for Scotland. Mm -hmm. Now, I can write that script. I used to do so. Um, so, so in a sense, I, I, I don't see that as, as, as significant or a big deal. I thought your other point about the parallels with East Germany and the Baltics mm -hmm. was much more germane. Okay. In the sense that the point you were making mm -hmm. was that whatever else it is, the European Union is in some respects pragmatic, mm -hmm. and also that a lot that happens in and with and around Europe is the consequence of there being a political will. Mm -hmm. Hence, political will delivered the integration yeah. of Eastern Germany. Political will delivered the relationship with the Baltics mm -hmm. that you also referred to. And in a sense, that kind of proved the point I was trying to make. That if there were genuine political will mm -hmm. within Europe, from a philosophical point of view or from a material self-interest point of view in the proposition of Scottish independence, then it seems to me a tad surprising that the consistent formal messages on various aspects of membership slash integration slash currency relationships and the rest of that agenda, that the consistent messages out of Europe are not in fact manifesting, to my way of thinking, a political will to see the delivery of an independent Scotland and the subsequent re-acceptance or continued acceptance, whatever word we want to put on it, of an independent Scotland within Europe. So, so I think in a manner of speaking, you have confirmed the point that I was making initially. Can I? 
let, let me just take some of your points here, okay? Uh, if, 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 if I may go for it. Um, first, I, I, I did understand the Panama reference in terms of the dollar. Mm -hmm. um, I think the point I was trying to make is I understood that was in terms of you know who makes your decisions, but we can we, we, we can leave that as it was. Um, on the other one, on the internal point, yeah, I think you know that is a correct political response, and there will be wise diplomats such as yourself sitting with different different um, members saying <laughs> just don't get involved in this, don't get involved in it. Um, I used the point of East Germany and the Baltics and Greenland as well, I know that you refer to them as Germain, because the fact of the matter is there are no other precedents that, that, that we don't really, I mean this is this is the issue, I mean this is this is a great thing, is that we do not have, we, we, we have to use the precedent yeah. we have. And that's but why in a manner of speaking there is no direct model to no, follow. But the only direct model we even have to follow in terms of a country of, of, of somewhere being kicked out is Greenland, and actually that 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 that, that was a pretty complicated and convoluted um, process. So I only use them because this is the only precedent that we have. But what the precedent has demonstrated is where there has been a will, there's a way. And and Europe, if if, if Europe is based on nothing, and Europe is based, if we go all the way back, whether you agree with being part of Europe or not, Europe was set up and has been wildly successful in this part. It was set up as European um, steel and coal back in back in the late 1940s and developed from there, basically to ensure that Europe never went to war again. Right? If, if, if we go all the way back, Europe was based on respecting democratic ideals, which is why when the East German situation came up, when the Baltic situation came up, and when the Greenland situation came up, Scott, uh, Europe found a solution. In the same way, and this is why the Edinburgh Agreement is so important. If Scotland votes democratically and legitimately in favour of independence, the European Union would be going against its very founding principles by to not finding a solution. Democratic principles that are much more important than Article 48 or 49 of the Lisbon Treaty. I mean, and we can argue all night about Article 48 and 49 and lose everybody in this room if you like. But let's look at the, let's look at the basis on which Europe was founded, which is the most important thing. And that would demonstrate that where there's a will, there's a way. On your final point, on the political will, I, I spent a lot of time working with other governments in Europe, right? When we talk to them occasionally in the pub, late at night, it's foreign politicians like, oh, how's, how's your independence debate going? Just out of, out of interest. I think we have to remember, it, that, that we all have to remember sometimes that um, the foreign minister of the Czech Republic doesn't get up in the morning and worry about Scottish independence. The foreign, the Czech, the, the, the foreign minister of the Europe minister of the Czech Republic gets up in the morning and worries about how he's going to get the best deal for the Czech Republic out of the European institutions. How he's going to get the, the how he's going to get the structural funds that he needs. First and foremost, any politician worth their salt will be thinking about domestic politics and thinking about why the people in the Czech Republic, for instance, have put him into in, into his post. Therefore, I wouldn't be so um, self-indulgent, if you like, to think that we are so high up the European political agenda. Um, and that's why the, 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 the point you made, I can see the point you're making about political will and about people bending over backwards to, 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 to come forth and liberate Scotland. It's just not going to happen because people will rightly leave it up, this is an internal matter for the UK, and it's even why um, countries are close neighbours such as the Irish. And in Ireland, there would be political points for Fianna Foil or Fianna Gael backing the SNP, there would still be political points in some parts of Ireland, but they will not do so. So that's why I think um, nobody's bending over backwards to have us in, but that's because they've got, I'm afraid to say it, more important things. Just in the same way that post-independence, um, I suppose it brings up the Catalan point, Scotland's independent. The Scottish Foreign Minister will not wake up every morning thinking about Catalan independence. The Scottish Foreign Minister or the Europe Minister will wake up every morning thinking about, right, how do I get that European grant for Ardisier along the road there, or how do I get a better deal out of fisheries? I certainly hope it would be. Um, and yeah, so I think this political will, I think people will engage in it, but I just can't see them getting involved. Can I take one more question and then I think we're going to have to feed people in, John? Um, I fully understand people's obsession with, with Europe. Mm -hmm. I, I have regular discussions with a lot of my friends about whether, personally I think it would be better for Scotland to, be, to continue 
as a member of the EU. Some of my friends say, no, it's, it's not, we don't need that, we don't want that. So I mean, I can't see any reason why Scotland would not continue as a member of the EU. Mm -hmm. But if the worst case scenario, and it's been suggested Scotland might be cast into the wilderness, you know, you, you can look at another country in Europe, roughly the same size, with roughly the same resources, who are doing very, very well out with the EU. And the only difference I can see between Scotland and, and Norway is the fact they've got billions in an oil fund. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not going to be the end of the world, even if we weren't living here, yeah. in my opinion. I think that's a really important point. I mean, personally, I believe that we should be part of Europe. I think it's the right thing for us. But, and this, I suppose this is a nice point to finish off on, which is that everybody asks what's... If, if you look at the white paper, the white paper, I suppose, in many ways reflected what might be an SNP manifesto for a first independent election in 2016. Because the best thing about independence is that the very first thing that an independent Scotland will do will be to have an election to vote for a first independent Scottish government. Now, if a party stands and says, do you know what, I think we kind of had it with the European Union, um, and, and, and gets in, then people will respect that, because that's, that's the democratic will, and the people of Scotland can decide if that's the path that they want to go down. I think that's, a, that's, that's a, and Norway's a great example of a country that's just done extraordinarily well, that it became independent in 1904, um, and has done, and was reasonably, that's a poorer part of the Scandinavian bloc, and was seen as a, um, but because it's made its own decisions, has made a phenomenal success of itself. And actually, in population terms, is the country that's right next to Scotland, as well, and we look at countries globally. Okay, I think that's all the questions we'll finish off for tonight. I would like to do a thank you to Stephen for coming up from Edinburgh to answer all our questions. I think one thing that's um, obvious is on the yes side, we're prepared to come out here and answer the difficult questions, unlike some of the other politicians. So, and um, this is only one of a series of events that will be taking place. Our next one will be um, to uh, involve young people, to get young people involved. We've got a young chap coming up um, called Dean Williamson, and then we've got Dennis Carnarvon. So we're having monthly events, but I think for politicians and good luck in the election, anything we can do to help Stephen, we'll try and give you a Because we need more people like you. Know, Thank you very much for coming. Um, Thanks for having me along.